I appreciate very much this opportunity, and you know, that kind of introduction puts a speaker very much on the spot when he tells what an excellent job I did at the commencement of Utah Technical College and uh, all these things, because now it brings up so many expectations, and I felt a little bit like a situation I was in a couple of years ago. I think I might even have mentioned this that night at the commencement, but I was invited down to Albuquerque, New Mexico on a speaking assignment. And I didn't want to go alone, so I took one of my daughters with me. I took Kimberly. I have four daughters, and Kimberly is number three. She's uh, 13 now. But then she was 11, and she went with me that night, and she was seated at the head table with me. And it was my turn. The fellow stood up to do the introducing, and he did very much like the good doctor did and told everybody what a good job I was going to do. And then he went on and on. I don't know where he got this dossier, but it was very, very impressive. And Kimberly, I, I looked out of the corner of my eyes and I could see this little look of pride on Kimberly's face because she'd never heard anybody talk about her pop quite this way. And it would have been fine if the guy would have quit, but he kept going on and on and that little look of pride started turning to disbelief. <laughs> because she knows me better than anybody else. And this guy kept going, but nonetheless, Kimberly was impressed because when we got home, she was going up and down our street and everybody she saw, the milkman and the paper boy and the mailman she'd say hi I'm Fred Ball's daughter <laughs> everybody she saw she'd stop them and she'd say hi I'm Fred Ball's daughter and my wife Joyce heard her do this and she ran out and she said honey don't say that that sounds funny just be Kimberly Ball and we thought she got the message but we guess we, she didn't because the next Sunday we went to church and she was going up down the halls of our church and everybody she saw she'd say hi I'm Fred Ball's daughter Hi, I'm Fred Ball's daughter. And this time Joyce got her and she said, Kimberly, don't say that. Just say, I'm Kimberly Ball. Develop your own sweet little personality. Be yourself, honey. Well, she did finally get the message because the next night we were having a dinner party and we had a few people in our home. And as we were sitting in our living room visiting after dinner, Kimberly came running in the front door. And one of our gentleman friends said, uh, now who might this be? And she said, I'm Kimberly Ball. And he said, oh, you must be Fred Ball's daughter. And Kimberly said, Mama says I'm not. <laughs> well, I am. And I'm very, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here because I have a great, great love for this organization and for this fine facility and for this great school. And on your agenda, it says that I'm going to talk a little bit about Utah and Utah Tech. And I can tell you that Utah and Utah Tech have a great responsibility and obligation to each other in coming years. And I heard the good doctor talking earlier about how it's important that you do such an outstanding job. And then he talked a little bit about how we might be starting to train too many people. And this is something we haven't heard for a long time because we used to always be talking about the lack of people in the trades, the lack of people in the vocational fields. And I think that you're going to see a great, great need. I'm sure we're cranking out more than ever before, but there's a tremendous need for these. And I think you're going to see even a greater response to your product and a greater need for your product in the coming years. I do this because I think I see throughout the United States now a tremendous change in attitude toward the image of Utah. When I first took this Chamber of Commerce job, and I, I know you're very active now in a transportation program, and that pleases me because for 17 years I was with IML Freight Company here, most of the time in California, but I, I was in the trucking industry for most of my life, but four years ago I went to the Chamber of Commerce. And when I did, I discovered that one of my big problems was trying to change the image of my product, my product of course being Utah and the Salt Lake area. Because whenever I went out to try to attract new industry and new jobs to this state, they would look at me like, uh, why in the world would anyone want to go to Utah? And this feeling was very prevalent all over the country. In fact, Fortune magazine in November of 1972 ran a story that asked a bunch of people involved with economic development. These were the people whose jobs it was to pick sites for new industry, new plants, expansion of their business. And these people were asked to list numerically in order of preference which state they would go to if they had to pick a site today. And this was in November of 72. Wyoming was 50th and Utah was 49th. Now I can see Wyoming being 50th. I really can. I said. <laughs> they don't have the transportation. They don't have perhaps the natural resources. They don't have this core of 
productive, educated, trained workers. But why Utah should have been 49th is something I couldn't understand. Because we do have, we are the hub of the West. We can serve 33 million people at second morning delivery. We do have an abundance of natural resources. We have more natural gas reserves than any place in America. We have a very available, productive workforce. The most productive workforce, again, in the United States. The most educated people in the entire United States. And so here we were, 49th. It indicated to me an image problem. A selling job had to be done. Shortly after I read that article, I went back to Boston, Massachusetts. And I know you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to take out these young Mormon elders to dinner. But I had a young neighbor boy of mine who was back in Boston on a mission for the Mormon church. And I thought I perhaps would like to see him. So I called him up and asked him if he'd like to go to dinner. And he told me he would. And so I said, where should we eat? He said, well, why don't we go to the top of the hub in the Prudential Building? It's good. It's very uh, beautiful view. And I think you'll like it. So I told him, all right. I said, Bruce, how do we get there? He said, well, why don't you just come over to my place and we'll go on the subway? Again, it's cheap and it's fast and that might be a good experience for you. So I picked up Bruce and we went down into the subway. And as I was waiting for the train to come in, I saw this big poster on the wall in the Boston subway. They were in the midst of an anti-litter campaign. And this poster showed this guy with his white coat pushing a broom. And the big headline on the poster says, don't litter our subways. And then the subhead said, or we'll send you to Utah. <laughs> So I got back and I went to Governor Rampton's office and we talked about this a little bit and we got the mayor involved and we called the city of Boston and we said, uh, tell us a little bit about this anti-litter campaign in your subways. And they told us over the telephone, they said, well, you see, we got all of our creative people together, all of our advertising and promotion people, and we tried to come up with the worst possible place. We could send our litterers and Utah won. Image problems. We've had an image problem. People still regard us as the Great Salt Lake Desert. About that same time, Joyce and I went to a, a convention of the American Trucking Association. It was held in the Hilton Hotel in, in New York City, and Joyce went down to get her hair done that afternoon for the big banquet that night, and as she was sitting under the dryer, she started talking to the lady next to her. I guess you gals always do that. And this lady said, where are you from? And Joyce said, I'm from Salt Lake City. And she said, oh, do you know Dearden Jennings, Mr. Dearden Jennings, or something name like that? And Joyce says, no, I don't think I do. Is he from Salt Lake? And the lady says, no, he's from Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and then she looked straight ahead, and Joyce was pondering that for a minute, and she said to her, well, uh, why should I know this Mr. Jennings if he lives in Des Moines? She said, well, you know, Salt Lake and Des Moines, I thought you might know each other being so close together. <laughs> and <clears throat> Joyce said, well, evidently you've never been west. And the lady said, oh, yes, I have. I've been west only once. I've been to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> See, people really have no concept what we have out here, what we have to offer. And so we've had an image problem. Our job at the Chamber of Commerce is to try to go out and uh, convince people that this is not still Indian country and that we are uh, people who have many, many things to offer as far as quality of life goes and as far as all the many things that we have to enjoy. So in the last few years, I think we've had some successes. We've had some major successes on new jobs. And incidentally, I know some of you are thinking right now, that why do we want them? Why do we want new industry? Why do we want more people coming? Because it is controversial. Anytime I talk about growth or new industry or new jobs, I get people mad at me. I used to, well, I still get on it occasionally. I don't get on it as much as I used to. I used to go over and get on KSX Radio, KSXX Radio occasionally with John Prince. I don't know if any of you ever listened to it or not. But uh, a lot of kooks call in on that show. And <laughs> what? One night I was talking on K6 Radio and I was talking about new industry. I was talking about National Semiconductor, that we were just ready to announce, we're going to announce it in two days, and that we were going to bring in this new industry. And I had a telephone call from this sweet little lady, and she said to me, young man, do you realize what a dastardly thing you're doing to the state of Utah? Why do you want to court the pollution problems? Why do you want to court the minority problems? Why don't we just steal off the borders? We don't want any more growth. She said, don't you know you're going against the basic tenant of the majority religion in this state? Don't you know that Brigham Young said, beware a stranger in your midst? I don't know if he ever said that or not. I really don't. But she, she sounded very authoritative. And so a couple of days later, I was over to 47 East South Temple, and I was talking to President N. Eldon Tanner of the Mormon Church Presidency. And I said to him, President Tanner, does the Mormon Church have a philosophy or a feeling about new industry and new growth in the state of Utah, new jobs? 
And he told me something that I thought was very interesting. He said, yes, we do have a feeling about it. He said, we export out of the state of Utah our most valuable commodity. We export out of this state every year about 13,000 of our young people. These are people right out of our high schools and right out of our colleges, and they're leaving not because they want to go out and make a fortune. They're leaving to go out and make a buck. To get a, he doesn't talk that way. To go out and make a, get a job, you see. He's not after a, for, they're after a fortune. He says, <laughs> I paraphrase occasionally, you see. But he said, yes, we have a feeling we want new jobs. We want new industry. Then he cautioned me to be selective to get the kind of industries that we need, to get the right kind of jobs, to get those kind of industries that won't destroy this great quality of life we enjoy. And I've thought about that a lot lately, that we have exported our most valuable commodity on a regular basis for many years, and I identify with that because I was one of them. I left Utah right after I got out of college for California, and I left because I didn't have any opportunities here in the city of Utah. And I'm, I'd married a little girl from Spanish Fark, just before, that's what she said, just before I went to California. Somebody from Spanish Fark? And uh, I don't think there was a day went by for 11 years that she didn't say, when are we going home? When are we going back to Utah? And I never came back for a long time because there wasn't opportunities for us in Utah. And so I think that you and I have an obligation to prepare these people for opportunities. And at the same time, my job, perhaps, is to prepare opportunities for your product so that they can stay here. And I think most of our people live in Utah by choice rather than by chance. We're here because we have all these great things to enjoy. So our image is changing. Let me indicate to you again a little bit how I think this is happening. I told you about that Fortune magazine in 72, November 72. Last month, there's a very fine publication in the West Coast called Pacific Coast Business. This is a publication of the Chamber of Commerce of California, but it's widely read and distributed throughout Oregon, Washington, Nevada, and California. They had an article in there last month written by a fellow by the name of, uh, well, let me see, he's the president of the Fantas Corporation. His name is Mr. Fulton, president of the Fantas Corporation out of Chicago. Now, the Fantas Corporation is the world's largest site selector for industry. They are an industrial development site selecting company. And they go all over the world to find sites and pick sites for industry. And we're working with them right now on a couple of projects. But Mr. Fulton, he gave a talk and he said that recently their corporation, which is a subsidiary of Dun & Bradstreet, had just done a large survey on the 11 western states. And they rated on 13 different criteria the climate for business and the climate for growth of the 13 western states. He said that they had done this five years ago and Utah was 12th. This year Utah was number one. California was 13th. But we were number one in the west for climate for growth and climate for business and for the outlook for the future. And that's a long ways from that November 72 issue of Fortune magazine when we were 49th in the entire country. I see this image changing rapidly for lots and lots of reasons. Number one, we do have all of these things we talk about. Number two, I think we're doing a much better job of marketing our product than we used to. We used to always tell people to bring their industries to Utah because we had a great ballet. We've got brochures that show that. And I used to look at that and scratch my head and say, why should they come to Utah with their industry? Because what they're interested in is that bottom line. What can they get on their return on their investment? What kind of employees can we offer them? What kind of training can we offer them? What kind of support can we give them through our technical colleges and such things as this? So our whole spectrum now, we have a new brochure called the Salt Lake Spectrum that talks about reasons why businesses should expand and grow and provide jobs in this area. And I might tell you that the two-page spread in here is on your institution talking about this as a great plus that Utah Technical College is a great reason for businesses to come to this valley. And we've sent out over 20,000 of these brochures all over the country. I've got three people living out of suitcases, out talking to people about coming to Utah. And I might say that we're not just the Salt Lake Area Chamber of Commerce as such because we do not have a state chamber. And so the charge given to us is to bring jobs throughout the state of Utah, and we're very actively involved in that. In fact, I'll be very honest with you, we're trying very hard to get jobs off of the Wasatch Front. But at the same time, regardless of our efforts to get ne jobs into Nephi or Grantsville or Hiram, wherever it might be, those industries are still looking to where there is the amenities of life, the transportation, the natural resources, the employees, and all of these things are still coming to the Salt Lake Valley. But we're having some successes. I'm 
as I say, many of our successes are predicated upon your fine efforts here. May I just maybe summarize? I was supposed to take 20 minutes, and I think I've done that, I've done that already, but I wanted to maybe just talk for a moment about something. When Dr. Nelson called me, he told me that he'd heard me on K6 Radio one morning responding to attacks that are coming now on the business community. There's an organization called the Citizens Bicentennial Commission out of Washington, D.C., that is very, very active and spending thousands and well, millions and millions of dollars to overthrow the free enterprise system of business and government. They're emphasizing now that we've got to redistribute the wealth. Now, that sounds very, very fine on the outside. Redistribute the wealth. They say that from now on, every employee has got to own his company he works for. They've got to break up all corporations. The president of a company now has to be elected every six months by the voice of the employees. And every foreman, every supervisor, every uh, office manager will have to be elected every six months by the employees. And this whole concept, as I say, it sounds fine maybe. But when you start looking into it, I start wondering, what's prompting this? Why is everybody suddenly starts picking on this country? Why is free enterprise suddenly becoming the goat of so many, many critics throughout the United States? And it bothers me a little bit. I got on K6 Radio because a gentleman had come on representing this organization saying that we've got to break up American business concerns. We've got to have every employee own the company he works for. We've got to redistribute the wealth. And let me read to you my response that morning as your president has asked me to do. And I started by saying, I'm sick and tired of the critics of this country. I'm tired of the doomsdayers who say this country is going to hell in a handbasket. I'm tired of those taking pot shots at the free enterprise system, and I'm sick of those constantly clamoring for the demise of business and for that old chestnut of spreading out the wealth of this country. I'm sick of those ill-informed have-nots who can't tell the difference between profits and profiteering. Break up big business. Redistribute the wealth. We hear it time and time again. And why do we hear it? Why do we keep hearing this? Well, they keep on talking about, let's break up AT&T, break up the telephone company. Have you people ever tried to make a telephone call in a foreign country? If you can afford it, and you've got a couple of days to spare, just try to place a long-distance call while you're in one of these foreign countries. And what's it like here in America? Well, it's very easy and it's very cheap. It's the finest and most economical system in the entire world. And what do we have? We have these misguided, ill-informed doomsdayers saying we've got to break up AT&T, we've got to have hundreds of little telephone companies around the country. Let's be like other countries. Yeah, let's be like other countries with a rotten, expensive system that just doesn't work. And why are the critic hounds snapping at the heels of the telephone company? Well, because that company's big, because they're strong, and because they're very, very good. And it always happens. It's just human nature if you don't believe it. Just look at Ted Williams. You remember when he was in the heyday of his baseball career? He was booed and scorned every time he came to bat because he was so excellent at what he did. And I remember when I was a kid growing up, we used to always hear, break up the Yankees. Break up the Yankees. That was the constant cry in baseball. Why? Because they were so darn good. They made everybody else look bad. And it's the old story. People like to boo, take pot shots, and harass the champion and those who are the best. And who's the champion country in this whole world? the United States of America, and who has the finest standard of living of any place else in the world? And incidentally, that was come about in less than 200 years. That's only an eye blink of history, the United States of America. We're not that sniveling little backward kid on the block anymore. We're big, we're good, and so, well, we don't get much sympathy. We don't get anybody rooting for us anymore because we're too good, we're too great, we're too strong. And these people now are telling us, this People's Bicentennial Commission are telling us that this country is over the hill. Well, we're not over the hill. This country's barely a beardless post-puberty adolescent. What's probleming this country is not senility, it's acne. <laughs> In this country, our ism has not failed us. Capitalism is not a dirty word. Some of us shun even using the word anymore, but it's a good word. There's nothing wrong with capitalism because it hasn't failed us. To this day, it forgives us our trespasses and continues us to prosper us beyond any other. And I know that Uncle Sam sometimes gets sick. And Uncle Sam recently was sick. And he's going to get sick again, but every other November, and sometimes in between, he throws up, and he gets up, and he gets going again. Free enterprise gives us the chance to grow, to expand, to compete, and that's what this country's always been about. 
But you know, somewhere along the line, our politicians have forgotten this. Using the security slogan for bait, and that's vote bait, they've tried to get Americans convinced that being fed, being sheltered, and being comforted is life's highest purpose. But is it really? And if the government is going to provide all of that security, that shelter, that comfort, well, who's the government? That's you and me. We're going to have to be providing that. You know, there are more people working for the government today than that don't. We'll pay for those who want all that shelter, all that comfort. We'll pay for those who find that welfare, food stamps, unemployment beat the heck out of working. And you know, those who want all of those things from the government should join the army. Then you'll have everything provided except freedom because you can't have both security and freedom because freedom implies freedom to fail as well as freedom to succeed. Redistribute the wealth of this nation. Well, I'm sure we're going to hear it more and more again, but you know what that is? It's a bunch of poppycock. The wealth of this nation is not vested in just a few. Retired people enjoy the benefits of big companies and big company profits through their pension and retirement trusts. Every pension and retirement trust in this country is invested in business. Labor union members buy their dues being invested in business investments. Also in mutual funds, savings and loans, they all benefit. Everybody benefits from business and, of course, profits. Profits of business benefit millions and millions of Americans. And remember this, when profits diminish, so do jobs. And a true quality of life necessitates, first of all, a job. Jobs made possible by profits. And one final thought. This concept of dividing wealth amongst all people is certainly not new. It's been tried, and every time it's been tried, it's failed. Because eventually, those entrepreneurs, those who believe in work, in sacrifice, in the value of elbow grease, in diligence, will eventually end up again with more than the person who wants a dole, something for nothing. Without free enterprise, without the profit motive, without this great American concept, we'll be what many other nations of the world would be, a people of bearded bicyclists with B.O. screaming for something that was earned by somebody else. Thank you very much.